So this is an event that's been sponsored by I4P. I4P is the Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practice. I shouldn't have to read this off because I'm associate director, actually, of the Institute. <laughs> but I, some, the title is so long, you know, I always forget which way around. So it's the Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practice. And the Institute is, is a cross-faculty institute here at, at Chill, as many of you know. And we are probably one of the most visible institutes here at Chill because we have had over almost 100 events now over the last couple of years and uh, have organized, I think, something like eight or nine conferences alone here in, in, in Chill. And um, also, you know, various film events and events in Parliament, and that's, that's Parliament in London, of course. And thousands and thousands of people have, of course, looked at our YouTube videos. Uh, which are the YouTube videos of these events, nothing else. So uh, not that you get too excited about these things. It's not no music. So um, today we're going to have three speakers. Everybody will speak probably for about ten minutes. And come on in, yeah, come on in. And uh, we um, they will both speak for ten minutes, and I'll just hopefully then engage them in a bit of a discussion. And then we also involve the audience. Hopefully, we get about another 15, 20 minutes or so for question and answers. Okay. Right. The first um, speaker today, and I'm so glad you stepped in for your colleague. Unfortunately, we had a, uh, a cancellation by our um, uh, guest speaker. But uh, is Susan Foster. Susan is the director of public health for St. Helens, St. Helens Council. And she is interestingly also um, the lead for the suicide prevention um, uh, um, suicide prevention um, area in the so-called CHAMPS. That's a collaborate, collaborative or collaboration of the dir um, directors of public health in the area. So this is going to be interesting, and I think she will tell us, talk a bit about that collaboration as well at some at some point. So that's going to be great. Um, I will introduce the guests, the other guest speakers, then as we go along, if that's okay. All right, Susan, it's uh, your floor. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, like uh, Public Health, we uh, did not necessarily uh, answer the exam question as we started, so why is Merseyside worse than everywhere else? So I did a, a little bit of fiddling around with the presentation to try and do that for you. Hopefully what I'll cover, I won't cover all of this because it will be a bit too long, but just a tiny bit about Merseyside and the assets, a bit about history and our key challenges, what we know, so are, are we worse than everywhere else, something about determinants of health, and we probably won't get onto what we are doing, but you're quite welcome to have the presentation afterwards about some of the key work that we're, we're working on. So, um, looks fantastic, doesn't it, Liverpool City Region, which is Merseyside for other people. Um, you, there's lots of key assets in Merseyside, but I would say, and you know, it's about 1.5 million population. It covers those boroughs of St. Helens, Wirral, Sefton, Knowsley, Liverpool and Holton. So it goes across the Mersey. And, uh, but I would say more than anything, it's the people that are our assets. We have a strong history of public health and prevention, and we also have a strong sense of uh, identity and purpose. So everybody will know that a Scouser is a Scouser, but if you go to St. Helens, they also have a real identity. So all those boroughs have a true identity and a very strong sense of community. And I think we should hold on to that when we're looking at some of the solutions. So we do have a, a history of public health within the city region. We had Dr Duncan, which was the world's first medical director of public health. And we have many, many other famous um, uh, interventions. So for example, and I did not know this, so thank you for whoever did this presentation. Apparently, Matthew Dobson was uh, the person who found the first link between sugar and diabetes, and that was back in 1774. Uh, and we have lots of good things like the first deaf school, the first blind school, but also I think if you come more recently, more notable, um, Liverpool City region was one of those regions that really pushed the campaign around smoking in public places. And it was because of Liverpool and places like the North East that the, the health policy was changed. So we can really change policy. And that has had a real impact on some of our uh, determinants of health. 
And if only we could do that for minimum unit pricing, the job might get a lot easier. So, um, we are collective leaders. So, we work at Liverpool City Region, working with Steve Rotherham in his office, um, uh, as devolved. Uh, although health is not devolved, we try and get the wider determinants linked in with all of our health messages. But we also work along a bigger system across Cheshire and Merseyside, so all the directors of public health take a lead area, and as mentioned, I uh, particularly um, lead on suicide prevention, which is a real challenge for us. Um, we have poorer life expectancy and health li health expe healthy life expectancy than the rest of England, and it is plateauing in, in some areas. And in other areas, um, for example, um, the Director of Public Health in Blackburn with Darwin speaks about actually it's going back in some areas, it's actually reversing. We have an ageing and growing population and that's both in numbers and weights, so public health, we like to bring our obesity into everything. But people are living longer with complex conditions and actually they, it hasn't really changed when they get those conditions. But, you know, medical advances mean that they're living for a lot longer with those conditions. Lots of lifestyle-related illnesses uh, and increasing inequalities and stark internal inequalities. So, for example, I can show you in a bus route in St. Helens, it's less than 1.5 miles long. The, I the life expectancy differences are 10 years and that's not acceptable. So I thought, well, we should ask, answer the question, and I've used uh, life expectancy here, and these are for both males and females. So are we worse than everywhere else? Well, we're worse than England, that's for sure. That's all red. All you need to know, it's red, it's bad. It's significantly worse than England. So our life expectancy <coughs> isn't as good as the rest of England as a whole. But the challenge is... Is it worse than other areas that are similar? So the top one is Greater Manchester and the bottom one is Tees Valley. And well, you would say, they're not really any better either, are they? So is this a North issue or is this deprivation? And, um, and why is it worse in these areas than elsewhere? So it isn't just a Mersey issue, this. So, and I wanted to put this in. This was uh, something I found yesterday. It was a bit controversial, but... Recent report by the Office of National Statistics when those life expectancy figures came out. People living in Scotland spend the highest proportion of their life in good health despite having the lowest life expectancy. So due to their shorter lives. So are we answering the right question? So does it matter? I mean, and this is a challenge. I say it does and that we should be looking at ideally happy long lives. Um, but we need to always check whether we're asking the right question. So, you know, a bit about social determinants of life, about selection model, about, you know, if, if you are from a good home, you're more like in, in good health, you're more likely to achieve. If you're in poor health, you're more likely to go down the social gradient. So you end up, so all those more unhealthy people actually end up in the poorer places. Um, not always true, but it is true. And it don't, you know, the correlation between m mental health and unemployment is quite um, stark. Um, people with low social status behave in wa ways which cause ill health, so behavioural and cultural model. But however, you know, some of this you've got to challenge. Is it that they behave um, that way or that their social norms are different? So I know there's a, a paper just recently being published, the propensity of um, poor, um, um, uh, say for example, hot food takeaways, betting shops in poorer areas are a lot greater than they are in uh, lower and higher socially economic areas. So is there, is there choosing that or is their social norm different because their environment is different? And also, have they had a family that where actually mum died at this age, that's okay. I, I, I'm quite happy with that. And people with low incomes cannot afford to access the res resources which promote and protect health. 
So there's been uh, recent studies to show that uh, alcohol uh, misuse is, is great in higher socioeconomic environments than it is in lower socioeconomic environments. But it actually, it comes with, you know, not many other things. And so um, people in lower socioeconomic um, environments might be taking the alcohol and doing other negative impacts. So they have less ability to protect their health. Um, less likely to get a personal instructor to help them do the gym or a life coach and things like this will, will help. And social status itself creates its own uh, causes of ill health. We know that actually, you know, some degree of stress might, might be okay, but continuous stress is not good for your health. So, um, Early life, and, I, I, and this will be picked up in one of the later presentations, early life environment has significant impacts on health later on in life. So, um, and this is the life course model. You can see early years, skills and development, employment, prevention we have to do right the way across. But actually, you know, those early years are really the most important. So there's been a lot of discussion about adverse childhood experiences. And if you have four or more adverse childhood experiences, and these could be domestic violence, parents with mental illness, uh, parents with substance misuse, separation, um, it could be neglect, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. But if you have four or more, you're 9.7 more times likely to be a heroin addict or a crack cocaine user. And, and just other things like 1.8 times more likely to be uh, morbidly obese, 30.6 times more likely to have an STI. And there's a whole list of other conditions. We know it impacts on chronic um, heart disease, it, it, um, it impacts on diabetes. So actually, we need to really get upstream and build it around the family. <laughs> So Marmot Review, there were two, two uh, well, there's more than two significant reports, but recently Marmot Review for Fair Society, Healthy Lives and the June North Report, Inquiry on Health Equity for the North, um, both highlight that actually um, some of this is not acceptable. And so, for example, um, health inequalities, lots of them are um, largely preventable. And it's estimated, and this was what Marmot found out, that uh, the annual cost of health inequalities is, was between 36 billion and 40 billion through loss of taxes, welfare payments, and cost to the NHS. So if we, it's very complex. There is no golden, um, golden bullet to address this. It is around the wider health issues. It's health by uh, in relation to debt, in, to, in relation to substance misuse, in relation to housing, in relation to a lot of those real social determinants. But I think the Jew North report, which um, I, I, I think just took this a step further, and I'm just pulling out one little bit of this, is that it mentions about the diminishing public expenditure controlled by local government and the limitations of actually local areas to produce solutions for themselves. So centralised versus localism. And I know with dev devolution we might <coughs> actually be trying to address this. But actually the UK has some of the lowest levels of voter turnout and highest levels of inequalities. And we really need to ad address some of the uh, political issues in relation to health inequalities and really get some local localism and uh, maybe uh, devolution has the uh, ability to start to try and, and address some of this. But I'd also say the NHS itself as an anchor organisation, and I'd say this by big public sector organisations here that actually employ people from poor communities. They really need to do more in relation to social value and maximising opportunities in local areas and looking at things like their procurement rules and what they're doing in relation to uh, trying to address health inequalities. I'm going to leave it there. I've got loads more. 
and I hope you, it's given you a flavour of my thoughts on why we are worse. Thank you so much, Susan. That's fantastic. Um, and our next speaker is Andrew, Andrew Woods, and he is the head of the lead of the Statutory Accountability Service uh, at the uh, Working at Mercy Tower CCG. And interesting enough, this also cuts across various providers, uh, about 30 across the CCG area um, across Merseyside. Have we got the. Is that okay? Is that the one there? Yeah, yeah. And if you. Look at down here. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Hello, everybody. Axel, thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, Andy Woods, I head up the Statutory Accountability Service, which supports uh, Merseyside clinical commissioning groups in the NHS to make lawful decisions. So, a lot of my work is around making sure that certainly, certain legal duties are kind of followed as, as commissioners make decisions and health service make decisions. So mine's going to be a very different um, presentation to, to Susan's uh, presentation. To those of you who don't know, clinical commissioning groups, um, there are six in Merseyside, Holton, St Helens, Knowsley, um, Liverpool, South Sefton and Formby, and um, uh, South Sefton. Um, CCGs for short, and they do what they say on the tin. They're clinically led. So if you look at Southport and Formby, um, all the GP practices form a membership. They vote their peers uh, to sit on a governing body or a board, and essentially it's their job to buy in services to kind of treat the clinical needs of the population, but within the financial envelope, and I think that's kind of key. Um, so, so my presentation is going to be very different. It's, it's, it's really looking at uh, where does the NHS sit in terms of health inequalities. You know, we're talking about health inequalities that are caused by huge societal factors. Where does the NHS sit? Um, what does the NHS, uh, what, what can the NHS do about some of the health inequalities? What are some of the pressures the NHS is under? And how that's probably having a negative effect in terms of health inequalities? And certainly, um, I'd, I'd kind of resonate some of the, some of the um, uh, comments Susan was making. I think the NHS can do a little bit more. Um, so, so this is kind of my view, really, really around my observations. I'm not an academic, so um, uh, anything to do with models or trends are probably over and above my capabilities. So just really uh, um, a quick slide. Fundamental causes of, of health inequalities are much larger than the NHS. Uh, if we just look at some of these factors here, the NHS has very little um, leeway with some of these issues. So I just want to pick on, on, on some of the things. Global economic forces, political priorities and decisions. We know that uh, this is all based in the, within the context that there is an unequal uh, distribu distribution of income, power and wealth. And we know that we live in a society where there are embedded uh, inequalities around discrimination. We know that if you're, you're a man, you're a woman, you're a disabled person, you're a child, kind of the list goes on, then, then uh, sometimes in life when we kind of make decisions, um, are, we're hitting barriers and that affects and impacts negatively on our life chances. So, so big issues there. We know we've got wider uh, environmental influences here. And again, you know, the NHS is a huge employer in terms of um, um, uh, people in the labour market. And I do believe that the NHS can do a lot more in relation to that. Uh, but again, it's kind of limited. And, and really, we've just got to do this in the backlog within the context to give it some perspective that the NHS is facing unprecedented pressures, financial pressures. We see that in the news. It's facing unprecedented demands on its service for all the reasons kind of Sue's outlined. We're getting older, health inequalities are increasing. We've got local authority austerity, and we've got big decisions taking place in terms of, of, of poverty and housing. So, so we know we're in that context. So the, the key thing that I want to say is where I'm coming from is I'm supporting clinical commissioning groups who some of them, not all of them, are making difficult clinical decisions, difficult commissioning decisions. So just to give you a scope, two thirds of all clinical commissioning groups who buy in our hospitals and our community services uh, are in deficit. So two thirds uh, nationally are in deficit. So uh, it really is unprecedented time and change. And then if we look at the final kind of column, the effects, the NHS in the main 
is dealing with kind of the causes of uh, the effects of health inequalities and it's trying to treat them as best it can. You know, it is a very fair, it's one of the most equitable systems in the world. It's free at the point of access, but it's not perfect and I think it's under increasing um, pressure. So we know that if somebody uh, approaches primary care, uh, is diagnosed with cancer, we can extend the life of people, but that's really all down to the fact, are people accessing the right service at the right time and the right place? And so if I don't speak English, if I'm disabled, if I'm isolated, these are all impacts that, that we believe, I believe that the NHS can do um, more on and is doing and getting better at. A really quick slide, again, I'm not going to spend too long on it, but um, the vertical is the percentage of, um, of households, the horizontal um, from the left to right, poorest to richest. This is around um, people who are much more at risk of mental ill health. Clear correlation if you're poorer um, to, 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 to the richest fifth on the right hand side. And really significantly for me, women seem to be a loser in comparison to men in terms of, of ill health. So I'd really urge, and part of our job in supporting clinical commissioning groups, is to dry, try and break down its patients and, and its communities by characteristics. Males, females, younger people, older people, uh, people from uh, different, different ethnic backgrounds, etc. So clear correlation. I'm going to miss this slide. It's just around interconnectivity, but but on hindsight, it's not the most inclusive, so I'm going to skip that. You know, statistics and trends for me, uh, you know, are, are really, really useful. I'm not an academic. Um, you know, Susan's quite clearly uh, presented some really um, informative stuff um, to us. But in terms of the real world, uh, my observations as a governance manager, looking at legal issues, supporting uh, clinical commission, commissioners to make legal and lawful decisions around some of our duties, like our equality duty, our duty to consult. I see these things, so this is my observation. This is not an NHS view, this is very simply my observation. But I do see people within the NHS who are overworked, and that's from you know, GP surgeries, that's in hospitals, that's in um, other primary care services, and I'd say the same at clinical commissioning groups. People have got huge portfolios, people have got to make big decisions. And the consequence of, of overwork and stress is unintentional carelessness. So things do slip through the net. I don't think it's intentional. And that's obviously got an impact on health inequalities. I think we're also, in, in the current NHS landscape, you know, we are trying to meet the immediate demands. So, uh, uh, you know, commissioners are under pressure um, in terms of, of, of making sure that our NHS services are sustainable, can meet the demands. And I think this with, with kind of the finances, the numbers underneath there, we are in a financially driven system and have been for a long time. And, and we're really looking at, at making, making sure that you know, if we look at South, Southport and Formby CCG or South Sefton, they spend nearly 60% of their money, of their budget, on acute services, so that would be Southport and Ormsgate Hospital and Aintree. So it really is trying to fend people, keep people away from A&E &A because it's very expensive. Um, and, and sometimes we've kind of, we've got to make sure that we're readdressing the issues, that we're, we're, we're integrating ourselves much clearly with, with, with the work that Susan's doing, which we are, and, and, and really looking at how we correct services when we come across some issues. So in terms of health services, there are a number of issues that I'm clearly involved with that are legal um, requirements where, where you know, patients, communities, providers, any stakeholder has a recourse through judicial review back to the decisions that NHS trusts, NHS commissioners make. So, so some of these are the NHS constitution, which clearly says services need to be equitable, irrespective of how old we are, what our race is, etc. We have the Equality Act, which is a very powerful piece of legislation, um, which again, services and, and again, uh, commissioners really do need to utilise, particularly when we're looking at the context, which I said before, we've got two thirds of clinical commissioning groups in deficit. So, you know, ir irrespective of which way you come at it, there's difficult decisions to make. How can we mitigate that? How can we look at our health and equality duty and our Human Rights Act? There are a whole range of stuff here around the NHS and health inequalities. We monitor our providers around all these duties. You know, we are trying to incrementally get some improvement. 
uh, around that. And there's a whole range of other in indicators, the Marmot indicators, uh, which is very much a public health um, uh, kind of number of indicators and KPIs. But also we can, we can measure inequalities in terms of the NHS through how many GPs per head of the population there are, what's the quality, what are the waiting times. Just here, just in the second column, uh, I am conscious of time, you know, we've really got to be, um, uh, uh, I suppose, we, again, you know, we know that, you know, health and social care, the NHS are doing a lot of work, particularly public health around campaigns in terms of cha changing lifestyle. And we know some of the CCGs do that. They had a huge campaign under um, um, Healthy Liverpool to get people more active. So there are things that are happening. It's a huge employer. I agree with Susan. I think we need to do a lot more about encouraging people from deprived backgrounds, disabled people into our workforce. And, and kind of those things, again, are kind of inc incremental things that we're trying to embed. Um, just really want to just look at this. You know, ultimately, you know, uh, within the NHS, uh, you know, it's under a lot of pressure but, but going back to that first or second slide, we do live in a world where, you know, we are getting older. With age comes disability. So only 17% of people are born um, disabled or with an impairment. Most people acquire it with old age. Where we just, we, we do need to get better. And part of the issue is we don't know where the problems are. So if you are disabled, if you can't speak English, if you're isolated, um, if you're a child, you don't complain. So there's very little information the NHS has um, in terms of, of addressing access and poor outcomes. But clearly there are issues, there's Dorothy, 80-year-old woman, partially blind, condition getting worse, wrote a complaint letter, the first complaint letter that, that came into the system um, uh, for, for many, many years around um, visual impairment. And there was a whole range of issues where quite clearly uh, the NHS were not meeting um, um, the communication information and access needs. So when we do know about it, we kind of put it right. So we're, we've currently got some systematic, system-wide um, um, programmes in place to try and address this issue. But it's just really saying that we are living in a world that's we're under pressure and there are sustained um, inequalities. Okay, and last slide. Uh, for me, this is just kind of an afterthought, really. Um, it really is around community-led services and it does link into what Susan is saying. The NHS currently has lots of policy around population health systems. So how do we integrate with our local authority, with the community and voluntary sector? What I'm really saying here is I really think the community and voluntary sector plays a crucial role. Um, and I really would like to see them at the table as an equal partner. But currently, you know, the reality is services are under pressure, services are being cut. And services are commissioned um, uh, in the same way they were commissioned many moons ago. So top down, control and command, I'm the coordinator, you're the service user, we're open nine to five. When really I think what we should be doing is working very closely with our, our, our public health colleagues and commissioning services really that are community led. Really quickly, I work through a, a friend um, to support the well, which is in Barrow and Fairness, which is, which is getting people, for, uh, where it supports people um, who are substance and alcohol misusers. And the vision is they're actually removing people from the system. You know, for me, this is unheard of. And it is all around that community-led kind of service, doing things very differently. And that is kind of currently funded by Public Health England. And I would say that Public Health are the innovators in terms of commissioning um, voluntary services. And that is me. Thank you. speaker. Um, absolutely delighted to um, have the David here, David uh, Taylor Robinson. Where shall I start, uh, David? Um, Professor of Public Health and Policy, that's probably a good start. Uh, honorary, honorary Consultant Public Health uh, at Alba Hay. And what is probably of most relevant uh, relevance here today, um, he was the lead of the child health component of the uh, Due North uh, report, inquiry on uh, health equities for the North, and that was 2014. So very delighted to have you here. And I know you're going to work miracles in distilling your 20 slides into 10 minutes, mm. or eight minutes, or yeah. something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was yours. Great, so thank you, it's great to be here. I was just, so if, if germ theory was operating system 1.0 for health and social care, 
The system we're on at the moment is probably 1.8, and it's about optimizing chronic disease management. Operating system three for health and social care will be a focus on prevention across the life course and making sure that we design a system where every child can flourish. So if, if I, that's just popped into my head as a, as a summary for the talk. I'm going to focus on what we discussed in the G North report with, with regard to kids. So this was commissioned by Public Health England, led by then Margaret Whitehead. I was involved in the child health component of G North. I'm going to try and talk through the inequalities challenge we face, the causes of these inequalities, some of the main challenges that are coming our way at the moment, and a little bit of evidence that we can make a difference. So this is, this is the starting point for Due North. It shows the north-south divide, the blood red of the north, the green fields of the south, in terms of the difference in, uh, in life expectancy. Such that if you take the life expectancy of a child born in Kensington in London, compare that to the life expectancy of a child born in Kensington in Liverpool, there's over a 10-year gap and over a 20-year gap in terms of healthy life expectancy. We know from the horrors of the Grenfell fire that even in areas like Kensington and Chelsea, you, you, you see similar inequalities almost within, within those small areas. And likewise, within, within Liverpool, here's our Mersey Rail map. You just jump on a train and life expectancy plummets by 10 years on the basis of a, of a short journey on Mersey Rail. This is the data. So this shows life expectancy by from richest to poorest tenth. There's a, a ten year gap there uh, in terms of life expectancy. And this is healthy life expectancy, showing the, the almost 20 year gap. Uh, when this data came out, the Telegraph pointed out that life prospects in Britain's most disadvantaged areas are worse than the average for Rwanda in terms of healthy life expectancy. And if you draw a line here at age 60, you can see that three tenths of the population born today cannot expect to reach age 60 in, in good health. And this is, a, this is a critical part of the story around inequalities, frailty, and the pressures that we're seeing on the system at the moment. One of the reasons that there's such pressure on systems is that such a big chunk of the population aren't living to old age in good health. So the, the kind of pressure on systems story is intrinsically linked to the health inequality story. What causes the health, in, in health inequalities? It's inequalities in the distribution of the main determinants of health. This is what drives health inequalities, inequalities in the determinants of health. And to be clear, this is what we wrote in the Due North report, these inequalities are driven by differences in power, poverty, power, resources needed for health, differences in exposure to health damaging environments, differences in exposure to positive health factors and protect protective conditions, and especially the conditions that give every child the best start in life. I'm going to show you that health inequalities start really early. But first of all, I'm just going to take a step back and show the, the position of the UK in terms of children's mortality. This is under five mortality on the y-axis, plotted against relative child poverty. The UK has the highest under five mortality in Western Europe, double that of Sweden, such that an extra five children die per day in the UK, above and beyond the rates that we would expect if we, if we all lived in, in Sweden. So intimately linked with levels of social disadvantage and if we move into the UK the, these are local each blob is a local authority this is infant mortality against child poverty infant mortality is now seven in Liverpool which is unacceptable this is child development this is early child development again each blob a local authority plotted against child poverty you can see that there's huge scope to improve the developmental p potential of all children in the country not enough children reaching good development at age five and a clear relationship with social disadvantage measured by poverty here. And this is the same deal, but with obesity and overweight. And I, I'm always shocked by the, the closeness of this correlation, such that 40% of kids are obese or overweight in Liverpool by the time they're age 10, which focuses the prevention agenda 
on the early years. We need to get the system right in the early years if we're going to do anything about this. Because we know that the conditions that children are exposed to cast a shadow over the whole of the life course. We know that... Okay, sorry, I'm getting, running away with myself. So I just wanted to show this slide. So we arrive at an understanding of health and development that looks a bit like this. So you can think of, you can think of the early years as a, as a period of investment in health which then plateaus as we get older and then it deteriorates. We're obsessed with influencing, tweaking, f focusing on this part when people are in terminal decline. But what we should be doing, in addition, is focusing on the early years, which affects the plateau of health that you reach. And this is important. These, these, these trajectories are influenced by the risks you're exposed to and the health protective factors that you're exposed to. And this is critical for the patterning of child health, but it's also critical for the patterning of the age of onset of adult chronic disease. So if we want to get to grips with inequalities in adult chronic disease, we need to focus earlier in the life course because we know that a whole range of problems, all these expensive societal problems, there's good evidence to show that they have their origins in the early years. I just want to show you some data about what's going on at the moment. This is infant mortality in the EU, highlighting the UK with our EU cousins at the moment in the 1960s. Let's move forward in time, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010. Uh, latest comparative data in 2014. So on the verge of leaving the EU, we have almost the highest infant, if you discount the Slovak Republic, we have almost the highest infant mortality. There's the plot over time showing the UK. And that's before the latest data came out in 2015, which showed an increase for the first time in over 10 years in infant mortality. Infant mortality doesn't usually increase in, in rich, developed countries. This is the data we did the analysis showing that infant mort all the rise in infant mortality has been in the most disadvantaged populations. This, for me, shows that there's something seriously wrong with the system at the moment, and it needs urgent investigation. The Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health produced this very helpful report not long ago, highlighting growing inequalities in a number of conditions, including, I won't go into this slide in any detail, but it shows increasing obesity in the most disadvantaged groups, decreasing levels of obesity in the most advantaged, so increasing inequalities overall. We've written a report about all this, there are recommendations. I'll just focus on the recommendations, the, the overarching recommendations. To, to address the system, we need to focus on poverty and economic inequality. We need to focus on kids, put children, public policy for children at the centre of policy making, and we need to get local communities more involved in, in, in these decision-making processes. So we said in the report, we stratified it, agencies in the north, we can do something in the north, we can focus our spend to a greater degree in the early years. We can protect the systems that we've set up that support early child development, the children's centres, etc. We focused on children's rights, getting local areas to sign up to a charter to protect the rights of children to the best possible health. Liverpool's done this. Liverpool signed up to the Child Friendly Cities initiative that UNICEF run. Child poverty is rising. This is one of the big challenges we face at the moment. After, after lots of uh, great work to reduce child poverty, it's now all being undone. This is a slide from a few years ago. Child poverty is expected to increase until all of the gains of the past have been wiped out over the next 10 years. An extra million children have moved into relative child poverty since 2010. And it's the, it's the result of purposeful policy. This shows the impact of universal credit on income. These are families with kids. These are the, fam these are the poorest families with kids where you see the biggest impact on income. Whereas pensioners' income has, has flatlined. It's remained the same over the, period of this, over the period of this huge recession. So you can do something to protect certain groups if you want to. If, and I think we've got to make the argument that we need to focus on children. The other thing that we're facing, despite the economic condition deteriorating, is are the budget cuts that we've seen to local areas. So th these are, this is the budget cut plotted against deprivation. 
uh, when, the, when the data first came out. This sh Liverpool's in the top right corner there. So the biggest budget cut, the most disadvantaged area, systematic differences between the north and the south, bigger cuts in the north. Uh, and then this is, this is what actually happened in terms of budget cuts between 2010 and 2015, plotted against sickness, premature mortality in the population. The biggest cuts to the areas with the sickest populations. This is the inverse care law playing out. This is Yoko Ono opening the children's centre at down the road for the uh, John Lennon School where my daughter goes. So with, with, in, with Liverpool CCG, we've spent the last 10 years arguing about whether we can keep the children's centres open in Liverpool. It's been, a, it's been a real struggle. And indeed, lots of children's centres have closed in disadvantaged areas. Strategies can make a difference. I thought uh, this is an example from the NHS. This is, this is what happened when you pump money through the NHS into disadvantaged areas. This was the NHS resource allocation strategy which, which diverted a little bit more money to more disadvantaged areas. Uh, this is what happened. This is, this is the opposite of the inverse care law. This is the proportionate care law, putting money where the need is. And what happened it, in Liverpool, this was spent on tackling the inverse care law. It was focused on the wider determinants of health, using the purchasing power of the NHS to as a major employer to, to boost employment chances. And in the paper, if you want to have a look at it, you can see narrowing of mortality amenable to healthcare over the period of, of this strategy, suggesting that there is something we can do with purposeful policy and money in order to reduce health inequalities. Lots to be done. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, David. <coughs> okay, um, given the time, I'm just going to open it up to uh, discussion with the audience, if that's okay. Um, anybody wants to comment anything? There's clearly, clearly quite, a, quite a few elements of the uh, equation. Yep. I'm, I'm interested in the panel's view on David Cameron's Big Society to put the control <coughs> back in the hands of communities in the voluntary sector, is this an abdication of central government responsibility? Okay. I, I do notice that that is a, a question about the past, not the future, but uh, maybe we can go through. Uh, any, any comments on this? Because I, I think, Andrew, you mentioned early on the, the role of the voluntary sector, and you th I think you thought, found it very, very important that the voluntary sector sits at the table as well. I mean, what I'd say in terms of the question, I think it's quite co complex for me to, to answer because I never really understood what was meant by big society. Um, for, for, for me, and I think I highlighted it in the presentation, uh, and, and I think um, David and Susan have concurred, I, I'm there at the very back end of services, at the acute end of services, where, where a lot of the attention seems to be in terms of deficit making um, difficult decisions, but, but most of the fund, it's kind of counterintuitive. You know, we've, we've heard today from, from Dave and Susan saying we need to pump money into preventative services. And we quite clearly, David's at the end, you know, has completely convinced me that that's where the money needs to go. But the reality is money's still being swallowed up at the acute end of services. And that's where the attention is. And anything, you know, anything, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who can, who can make this argument. David and Susan quite clearly are as a director and, and a professor to try and make those arguments um, to reverse, you know, what is for me t totally rational and logical to try and get that shift. But um, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a difficult um, issue because I fully understand the role of the voluntary sector and communities taking back control um, of their own health and it being community led rather than it being dictated to them is a real um, uh, answer to address some of these problems, but that's going to take a lot of time. So, I mean, I, I, I think uh, it's, it's clearly a good thing for communities to be in control of decisions and resources, but the challenge has been that the resources have been cut at the same time as, as the responsibility and some of the power has been devolved. So therein lies the, the poison chalice. You know, it's, it's, it's all very well uh, giving devolved areas 
control, but if they're then responsible for for wielding the axe, it can cause it can cause big problems. So, I mean, I, you know, there are lots of countries where you know, decent provision for the population is 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 woven into the the, the fabric of society. You know, chil children shouldn't be going to to food banks. People should be able to access health services and decent early years education. It shouldn't be up to the big society or, or non-governmental organisations to provide some of this. I think clearly they have a. But the charitable sector has been absolutely hammered as well over over the last ten years. So it's very difficult for for these. They get a lot of their money from from public money at the end of the day. So it's. Uh, I think it's ch challenging times, and it's naive to think that that w you know we can we can just patch all of this up. Uh, by ourselves with whatever resources left over. It needs more funding. Well, I, I probably agree with all of that. It definitely needs more funding. And what I would say about um, the voluntary sector, they have a role to play, as do you know people in communities, volunteers. We know that volunteering is actually good for health. However, it can't be at the expense of core services. And I think, um, some of the drive has al almost been at the expense of core services. In relation to even what the voluntary sector provide that has been commissioned as a core service. So, you know, many of our voluntary sector or um, community interest companies have been actually commissioned by core um, public sector to provide a service and they have been part of the the slashing of, of the budgets and, and everybody's looking at a smaller part of money um, being able to get grants from X, Y and Z. There is no sustainability um, built in and there's uh, very little in terms of if you think about workplace health within those organisations, how those individuals have to from year to year um, um, not know whether they've even got a job. So it's all built into actually their, their part of the solution and um, the funding has uh, their, their, their part, part of, you know, people who then live um, by the axe almost. Can I stoke a bit controversy here? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you dipped into controversy a bit early on when you said we have to make choices. And there was the interesting choice about good health and length of life. And I'm sure this, this was, you know, uh, just in, in, in the line of the argument. But I do, I do remember very clearly saying, a commissioner, uh, a commissioner saying to me very recently, um, and this was only about the NHS, um, you know, there is enough money in the system sloshing around. It's just in the wrong places. So the question is, uh, whether that's true or not, uh, the question is really, what do, you d what do we not do at the moment to get it into preventative services, to get it into child health rather than actually older people or acute care? You know? Because as you said, the, the, the pressures are enormous, uh, the political pressures are enormous, A&E, uh, waiting lists, et cetera, and all this, um, it, and that won't change. It won't change in the next three, four, five years. So what do we do about this? Are there any? Well, I, it, it's an interesting question, that because we're, we're talking about resources and money. And, and really, in reality, we're not going to stop um, treating somebody who's old for their, their um, health conditions. Um, but um, we possibly do need to start thinking about if we really are, are serious about the prevention end and starting really early, then maybe we do have to divert some of those resources. But actually, in reality, that is going to be difficult to do. And we probably need a du double running system to actually um, have some sort of benefit at the end. And at the moment, that, that doesn't seem like that's going to be something that will happen that easily. However, I do think there are opportunities about when you say money sloshing around, there are definitely structural 
things in the system that uh, mean there is not one NHS. You know, anybody who thinks there's one H NHS, they're not. They're all separate organisations, and um, there's there's all these things that make it a problem. There's organisations, there's professional boundaries, and then you know, let alone health and social care, and then you get into education. The, these are big organisations that need to start coming together with the solutions and working with their communities. I do think the only place that you can do it is at a place base. Um, level and uh, possibly I would say that because I am you know a director of public health in a place but you know um, but I think it has to be at a level where you can see the the benefits of that happening um, but the political um, ie the legal frameworks do not allow that to happen at the moment so this is one area that we're doing in St Helens. We are integrating health and social care and we're <laughs> having to get legal advice on how we can do that slicker without breaking the law for the benefit of the population. That is key. We've just got to keep our eye on the goal. I'd just I'd reiterate what, what I completely agree with Susan. I think we, we live in a world where public authorities are working from one year to the next. So. So irrespective of what we're saying, there's, there's a short term thinking to balance the books, um, to meet budgets. And again, it's this for me, it's this feeling of crisis management. So it's crisis management. All the trusts trying to reduce A&E admissions just seems to be this, you know, the huge target and what is occupying people's minds in a day in, day out kind of, kind of way. And until we resolve that kind of crisis, for me, it's how people get the headspace um, and the time and the resource to do things differently when everyone's attention's kind of constantly being drawn to, to, to that part of the system. Yes, I mean, somehow we need to put children at the centre of policy making. That's what I, that's, that's what I, I believe. Uh, we, we, we don't seem to be able to make those arguments at the moment, despite all of the evidence, all of the evidence that it's the most cost effective thing to do. We seem to have designed a system that is locked into the short term where where children are offset against the threat you know you've got this intergenerational warfare going on where where all you know all of the money is going into the elderly end of the spectrum and and we can't make the argument for prioritizing prevention i mean so so the allen report suggested that in 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 a period of austerity when you're cutting services at the same time you should be incrementally just shifting a little bit whatever you do just shift a little bit from the end of the life course, earlier in the life course, because that will, if you believe the economic, the economics, it will it will bring a return on investment eventually. But if you're working on yearly cycles, it's 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 quite difficult to make those arguments. So I think I think we need to think about the system. The other thing, the other problem with the economics is that local authorities and health services invest, and a lot of the return on investment comes a few years down the line, but it comes to the criminal justice system, reduced tax, etc. So distributing, you know, we're, everybody's protecting their own little budget <laughs> and hopefully in some integration will we'll help with that, but it's getting this equity across the life course that's the issue. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Bernie first and then John, yeah, Bernie first. Okay. I think one of the things with children is that Whatever money you pump into children, you're also pumping into the families that look after the children. And sometimes they're seen to be feckless or undeserving or the attitudes. You know, most people will love a child, but they won't necessarily vote to give money to people that they see would perhaps waste those resources. Um, many people vote for policies that actually will, will actually bring benefit to them. And as you sort of become older, or you become, you know, richer, or whatever, you want to, put, you know, people will sometimes protect that. How do we change that to see that children are part of a family that is deserving? I'm not saying that that's what everybody thinks, but it's a, it's an oft heard comment. It's it seems to be education society. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've been working in, in Denmark, and it's, it's, it's clear that we don't, we don't have the same attitude to children in, in the UK. Maybe it's a Victorian legacy, but they, they and Sweden, you know, I've spoken to people in Sweden, and they say that the, 
it, it was the women's rights movement was, was pushed forward on the back of lots of funding around families and children. They say, in order to have gender equity, you need to invest in services for children. That's how it was pushed forward in Sweden, apparently. That's, that's why they have such good services in some respects. I don't know, I think we need to continue I don't think it's not it's not a difficult argument to sustain that we should uh, we should put more money into services for kids because it has long-term benefits it's the right thing to do it's the most cost-effective thing to do I think what we we are seeing at the moment is the system unraveling and I think as if infant mortality continues to creep up think these things are politically unacceptable and and it, and it will be a real shame if this is what it takes in order to shift the system one of the interesting, interesting enough, though, Denmark and Finland were in infant mortality worse than Great Britain. So that's a really interesting uh, data that, that <coughs> come out as well. So, I mean, I'm sure there are statistical reasons for that, but uh, uh, so some of them, yeah. Uh, sorry. I, so. I, I just think, you know, at the end I talked about um, pol politics and, and actually voting. And I really think that we, we need as a society to work on our most deprived communities and, and start to bring them into that political system somehow. Um, because without their voice, um, we are going to be doing to them and that's not necessarily going to, to come up with the right solutions. Um, you know, I, I've worked a lot with uh, drug and alcohol users and they are the most amazing people when they have been through their uh, recovery and they're always in recovery and they are advocates for other drug and alcohol users and, and w we need to actually get some sort of democratic way of engaging with our, 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 our most deprived and, and if we can work on that with the families I think the children and the voices of the children should be heard alongside that and as well as working for example I know you were talking about children's charters we've been working on that in our local area and you know if you look at the work in Leeds and they've done on Leeds City I do think we, that we need to um, show how important it is that children are part of um, those um, that need to be protected like males, like females, like people of diff different sexual orientation. We need to, you know, embrace the whole lot. But I do think demo um, politics, it has a part to play in that. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, the voice of the patient is rarely heard, isn't it? We do a lot of consultations, but... Uh, 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 John, briefly. I was going to say, we're going to have a new medical school here at Hedge Hill. What advice would you give on how we could try and reduce these inequalities? Something practical here in this institution. What do you feel that we could do to really make the difference? Because it's, it's, it could be possible. Something caused... Tabula rasa. This is your chance. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I, you know, the, in terms of anchor institutions, I think... I think you know, getting kids from disadvantaged areas and encouraging them to be doctors and focusing on the importance of child health and getting some outreach going on. You know, we've, be, we've been trying to present some of this data to children in schools and ask them, why, why do you, what do you think's going on with, why, why, what's going on? And getting them to ask the policy makers the question. So I think some, you know, making sure that you're, you're working with You've got, you've got the needs of local disadvantaged communities in mind when you're designing a medical school. I think that's, you know, it gives you a real moral uh, mission, I think. And if you can, if you can instill that in students, what, 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 what more can you do? You know, the data, the data came out yesterday from The Guardian showing that we're seeing now the inverse care law in GP allocation. So GPs are now backing away from working in disadvantage, it's just too, you know, as we've seen, it's just too much. The data shows they're moving to the more affluent areas. A lot of, a lot of work went into getting GPs into those more disadvantaged areas and, and that seems to be unravelling at the moment. That, that will impact on health inequalities. Getting kids from disadvantaged areas in Liverpool working in those areas. Yeah. If you make it very short, yeah. Kathleen. Um, I was just wondering, do you think CCGs work? So we've obviously had huge discussions today about focusing on prevention rather than treating. 
but when CCGs are made up of you know, um, GPs, etc., which are very much focused on treating rather than prevention, do we think the scope of CCGs need to widen? I'm only asking because I'm, I'm a nutritionist and that's my background. And also. But for example, I, I've rarely gone into GP surgery where there's a nutritionist available, for etc., and you know, one of the main health problems that one I face is obesity. So do we need to broaden the scope of how these groups work? Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I will start. This is a very contentious issue, obviously, for me in terms of um, it's my job really to support and protect clinical commissioning groups. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on, on on that. But, but really, I think where, where clinical commissioning groups need to get to need to get smarter is by having, I think, the conversations around health health inequalities. I think it's you know for me it's it's almost you know and that and that does involve having. Uh, a wide discussion on a daily basis with stakeholders, other clinicians, um, with communities, different communities, and it's that conversation that needs to be had. But if you go to a governing body meeting, meeting at a CCG, it's doing two things. It's saying, you know, are we maintaining clinically clinically safe services, and are we bringing, um, are we spending our money within budget? Because legally, they've all got a legal duty to um, balance the books and that's the overarching duty and, and if they don't do that then uh, the way that the system works is is NHS England uh, puts recovery plans uh, into place so it's all that pressure so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have to have that conversation but I do think there needs to be a wider conversation with lots of key stakeholders it's how you do that that's how people get the headspace and time to do that I've got a view. You can, <laughs> can tell me itchy you now. <laughs> I mean, um, so I think the the principle of clinical commissioning groups was to put you know GPs at the heart of some of those decisions because they knew their communities um, very well and they were close to their communities. Um, however, in in reality, um, GPs you know it's very difficult for them because they have a ten minute consultation if they're lucky. You know they're not seeing the wider population health of their even their practice, let alone you know a, a clinical commissioning group. And if you look at you know those presentations and you look at some of the wider determinants of heart health a lot of those are not within the scope of a clinical commissioning group. So they're, in, they're more likely to be in scope of a local authority, uh, police, lots of other education, lots of other organisations. So that's why absolutely the only way forward is for clinical commissioning groups to come together with local authorities, with social care, with some of those wider agencies and really look at some of those um, issues. So for example, I know in one of our areas, everybody talks about social prescribing, but in reality, we decided that we were going to do social prescribing, which is, you know, we can't, we can't see that it's a health condition that is causing this person to keep uh, coming to our practice today. When we went into our first practice, they said, I've got a list of 100. I can name them. They could name all these people. And they might have diabetes, but that's not what they're attending their practice for. They're attending their practice for social isolation, for debt, for you know lots of other things. So actually, we have to get out with the, the, the practice and, and, and somewhere else. And just for you never being um, invited into a practice on uh, nutrition, um, I've, uh, we've been trying for years to get into practices. And, you know, if you look at, say, for example, in St. Helens, 70% of our adults are either overweight or obese. So that's a huge proportion of our general practice population. So they're probably scared themselves because they are that cohort. So they have their own health challenges because they're part of the population. And we always think that they're different, but they're not. Okay. Well, um, I think we need to wrap it up. We ran out of time, but uh, mm -hmm. can I just say a big thank you to our three guest speakers? Okay, thanks very much indeed. <laughs>